right, we good? Cool. All right, guys, let's open our Bibles up tonight, if you will. We're going to be in the book of John here in just a little while. We'll be in the book of John uh, here in a little while. So we've already opened in prayer, so uh, we'll, we'll continue to move, move on. <clears throat> so once you get out into the book of John this evening, we will uh, carry on. We will go forward here uh, tonight, all right? The Bible says, guys, if you will, in James, you can read this from the screen. We'll be in John in just a moment. The Bible says, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husband, husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it. Until he receive the early and latter rain, be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Beloved, we live in a, a world today that a world really and truly, especially for the Christian church today, waiting for the precious day of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're waiting for that which we have read about, studied about, preached about, waiting for the Lord's coming in the air. But guys, again, we mentioned this a couple weeks back, but we need to apply patience in our life as we await for the Jesus Christ to return in the air and call his bride home. Uh, so while we're here, while we're on this earth, guys, we have a work to do. Now this morning, uh, we had a di- we had a little bit of a different lesson. We were we were speaking on our testimony. Basically, we were speaking about our love that the brethren should have one for another. That that is the the distinguishing factor that you find that the world knows that we are the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ if we love one another. That is the that is the absolute difference. That's what it makes. So tonight, I want us to understand that there is a work for us to do. There's a work that we should be doing by and through the the house of God. There is a work that we, sh- we should be doing and a way that we should carry ourselves in this world today. So I want to submit this thought to you this evening that there is an assurance, guys, an assurance that we as the body of believers should portray, okay, on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you, you say, well, wait, hang on a second. I thought we have the assurance. Yes, we do. But guys, can I, can I say this to you here tonight and uh, see maybe if you can take this on board quite heavily this evening? If someone sees you frantic, panicking, bent out of shape, unsure of what's going to happen, what may or may not transpire, what do you think they're going to do? What, how are they going to feel? When I used to coach, uh, I I coached all four of our kids at one time or another. And, and uh, one of the, one of the philosophies that I had in coaching, I coached baseball and softball. One of the philosophies that I had is I didn't lose control in front of the players. Now, guys, I may be absolutely boiling on the inside. I mean, steaming mad with veins popping out of my head. That may have been true, but not one of my players ever saw me lose control, scream at an umpire, yell at another teammate, or yell at anybody else. The only person that I ever probably got a little bit frustrated with and put them back in their place was a parent, a parent who'd showed up inebriated to the park, and I told him that, you know, if, they, if they, they're, they're not allowed to come back here anymore, and I was quite frank with them. But I'm saying that to say this. I'm making this particular point. My philosophy, my, my reasoning why I didn't lose control with my players was because if I lost control and I'm screaming at them, they're not, ga- they're not gathering or grasping what I'm telling them. They're not going to learn if I'm out of control. What they're saying is, man, this guy's out of control. That's all they're focusing on. And so in this world that we live in today, in the time that we're living in today, we're going to preach and teach that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back and coming back soon. But if we're running around frantic like Chicken Little, the sky, screaming the sky is falling, they're not going to focus on what we're trying to teach them and what we're trying to tell them. They're not going to focus on, on the event that's at hand. They're focusing on how frantic you are. And if you're that frantic and you're that um, been out of shape, if you will, or let me just go and call it what it is, if you're that insecure and fearful in this world, they're definitely not going to be fearful, and they're not going to want to have what you have. So, yeah, we have the assurance of eternal salvation. We know that, and we believe that. We believe today that if we die, we're going to heaven, no matter what we have, have done. Amen. Jesus Christ has died for our sins, and we've accepted that free gift and that pardon for sin. We have the assurance in our heart. This world's got to see the assurance. Now, a couple weeks back, I preached on confidence, and I believe we should have confidence. Confidence and cockiness are not the same thing. But assurance in our life is portrayed in what Jesus Christ is. And we see this in his words here in John chapter 14. Look in John chapter 14 with me tonight. John in chapter 14 is where we're going to be. Look at verses 4 through 7. We're actually going to look at the first few verses of the the text. But tonight, for our opening reading, we're going to look at John 14, verses 4 through 7, and then go back to verse 1 shortly. Verse 4 says, And whither I go ye know, and 
and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth know, uh, ye know him and have seen him. Ye know him and have seen him. Now Jesus Christ is speaking here about knowing this way. If you look back there, if you will, and uh, if you look back uh, here in verse 5, and it says, And how can we know the way? Well, Jesus Christ says in verse 4, And the way ye know. And whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. So Jesus Christ is speaking to his disciples, the ones he refers to as knowing the way that he goes. And, and again, it's in the context of him coming back. But have you ever sat down, have you ever just sat down and pondered and thought about that way, the way that the Lord Jesus Christ is speaking of? Beloved, it was Jesus Christ who sat down, uh, who, I mean, who sent in, uh, uh, to, to bring that way, that way unto eternal life unto mankind. It was Jesus Christ who sent, who was sent down here to die on a cross, to be buried in a grave, to be, to be risen again, to bring this way that Thomas is speaking of, that Jesus Christ is speaking of, to this world. His creation was placed here for his fellowship, and that way is the way unto eternal life. And yes, there is only one way. So this way that Thomas is asking about, this way that Jesus Christ says, the way ye know, is something that the Lord specifically designed for his creation. Amen? Proverbs chapter 16, and in verse 25 says, There is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. So guys, I'm going to ask you this question tonight. Do you have the assurance in your heart, in your life tonight, that if you died, you'd go to heaven? Do you have that assurance? Do you have without a shadow of a doubt tonight, uh, and everyone with an earshot of my voice, whether they're online or they're in this room tonight, do you have the, the assurance without any shred of doubt that if you took your last breath here in just a few moments, that when you open your eyes, you'd see the Lord Jesus Christ? And you may say, preacher, I have that assurance. Then if you have that assurance tonight, if you've made that decision, and that's a decision you have to make, no church can make it for you, no family member can make it for you, there is no baptism that can do it for you, there is no choice, there is nothing anyone else can do for you to have that assurance. You are the one that has to make that personal choice. There had to be a time in your life when you realized you were a sinner and you were in need of the Savior. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, Jesus Christ said. And you made that profession unto him to accept him as the Lord and Savior and be born again. Okay, if, that, if you have never crossed that line in your life, my friend, you are not saved tonight. You do not have that assurance. This assurance doesn't come by way of a cookbook. This assurance doesn't come by way of, of a baptism. It doesn't come by way of a work. This assurance comes by way of the Holy Spirit of God through the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ who died and was buried and yet rose again. That's where that assurance comes from. And if you did not go through the steps that I just talked about, if you did not realize one time you was a sinner in need of a Savior and accepted that free gift of eternal life, you are not saved tonight. And you cannot walk through these worlds this evening and have the assurance portrayed of Jesus Christ in this world. The Bible, the Bible tells me that God requires an, a, a, a broken and contrite heart. Amen. That's what he requires. There's a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end, of the, way, the end thereof are the ways of death. There's a way that mankind is justified in their life that they should go to heaven. They live right, do right, work right, they give enough works. Uh, they were born in this religion. They were born in this household, born in this country. Uh, they were this Listen, those things, that may seem right unto mankind, but that way is going to end up in death and hell, amen. Unless you've come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, understand that you personally are a sinner and you need that Savior tonight. Unless you've come to that point and accepted Christ as Savior, you are as lost today as you were the day 20, 40, 50, 60, 100 years ago. The old saying says, Once my heart was black in sin, until the Savior came in. His precious blood, I know, has washed it whiter than snow. And in this world, I am told, I'll walk the streets of gold. A wonderful, wonderful day, he washed my sins away. That is the point that you come to. That is not the ways of man, which seemeth right. That is the ways of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that is the way that Jesus Christ is speaking about with his disciples right here. He says, the way you know, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come to the Father but by me. That's the way. That is the way. So one can never imagine 
the beauty of the free gift of salvation. No one can ever fathom the beauty and the gift of salvation, but what a gift it is. A gift that must be received, a gift of accepting the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. And in order to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, there must be a rescue. There must be a rescue. So, beloved, if you must accept the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior in order to receive the rescue in your heart and your life. Look back in verse 1 with me, if you will, tonight. Verse 1, the Bible says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. I mean, do I need to read that again? I'll read that again. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Friend, how often do you sit and worry about things that you have absolutely no control over? Zero control. How many times have you registered your bank account in your mind today? How many times have you dreaded going to, say, work tomorrow, the task at hand? Or how many times have you ever had fear of no fuel when you departed the house in your car? Probably very few times, or maybe many. You may hate your job. You may hate the task that you have to do tomorrow. You may hate to have to go to the grocery store. You may hate, and you may absolutely dread those things. But your heart needs a rescue. The souls of men, women, and children in this world today, their heart needs a rescue because most of our world, most of our world, most of our population today spends the majority of their times worrying about something they have no control over whatsoever. There's only one way that can provide such a delivery. There's only one way that can provide such a rescue. There's only one way that can bring the assurance in your life so that assurance is not only in your heart, but is seen in this world today. You know what? You know what? People have come to me before and they've said, Preacher, I'm not sure that I'm saved, and we're going through the plan of salvation with them, and I asked them what they did, and they've given me their testimony, and the best that I, I, I'm, not, I'm not the Holy Spirit, I, I'm not, a, I'm not a, a monitor, a meter, I can't tell you whether or not someone is saved and truly saved and born again, I don't know that, only God, God knows that. But they've come to me and given me their testimony, the testimony sounds sound, sounds good, you know, ticked off all the boxes, open, open bro- broken heart, open contrition, accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, just as we know the book tells us to do, yeah? But they sit there and they say, but, but I worry sometimes that I, I'm not really saved. Or, I, or I, sometimes I have doubts. I say, how many doubts do you have? Well, just every now and then I have doubts. The question I ask people like this is this question. I said, do you, do you question the fact or do you ever wonder whether or not you have a million pounds in the bank? And then I get a chuckle. No, there sure isn't any worry about that. There's no wondering there. I said, why? Because I know for an absolute fact I don't have a million pounds in the bank. Exactly. You know what? We never doubt what we know we don't have. We never doubt what we know we don't have. Now, guys, I'm not telling you that tonight to cool or calm the fires of of what the Lord may be working in your heart of being truly saved and born again this evening. So I'm not trying to calm them things. But I'll tell you this right now, beloved. If you've never had a doubt of your eternal destination, even after you were saved, you may want to go back and check that bank account again. And I'm talking about your spiritual bank account. You don't doubt what you don't have. Amen. The Bible tells me about this delivery. It tells me about this rescue in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and in verse 7. It says, Unless I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of the revelation, there was given unto me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecution, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Beloved, Jesus Christ is telling his believers. He is not telling the world. He is telling those that have accepted him as personal Savior Let not your heart be troubled. Why? Because the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ is sufficient for the rescue of our heart, soul, mind for all eternity. Amen. In order to have peace, in order to have that rescue, in order to partake in that, and to have that assurance in this life, to walk through this life with the assurance, and the world see that insurance, you're going to have to make sure that your heart is not troubled and your faith is placed on Him. Too many people today are trying to carry the load by themselves. Too many people today are trying to carry too much of what the Lord has said. Listen, you need to get rid of that. 
Jesus Christ said, come unto me, all you that are, that are, are burdened and heavy laden. He goes, and I'll give you rest. Take this yoke. He said, for my yoke, he said, what did he say? Is light. You know why his yoke is light? Because he's in there carrying it with you. He's in there carrying it with you. There's a rescue, my friend, for those who have named the name of Christ. There is an assurance that you should have in this world today. I can go ahead and promise you this tonight. If I did not believe in eternal security, if I did not believe in eternal salvation, if I did not believe that, that when I accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior on the last day of 1990, at the age of 19, if I did not believe that doctrinal truth today I would probably have already, and I under 50, I probably would already have lost my ever-loving mind. They probably would have to put me in a, uh, a padded room somewhere with one of those belt, those uh, crazy jackets or whatever they're called, a straight jacket. That's what they would have had to do to me. If I did not believe what the Bible says about being eternally saved and sealed in the day of redemption, I'd have lost my mind years ago, decades ago. Amen. Hands down. But because of the assurance that Jesus Christ has given us, let not your heart be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. I believe the words of my risen Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. The rescue, guys, there is a rescue. There's only one way of that rescue, and that's through Jesus Christ and him alone. No other way. Not through a preacher, not through a priest, not through a building, not through a, anything. It's just through Jesus Christ. So therefore, because of the rescue, says, let not your heart be troubled. But beloved, let not your heart be troubled, because not only is there a rescue, because after the rescue, guess what comes? There comes a residence, amen? There comes a residence. We're all talking about setting up residency somewhere, amen? Look at verse 2 with me. He says, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place. Watch that. Look at that next word. I go to prepare a place for you. That's a personal residence, amen? Now, we're renting a house right now. That's not our house. It's a delightful house. It's a beautiful house. It's three minutes walk from the church, which is, is wonderful. I'm going to love, uh, hopefully the Lord willing, we'll be just around, you know, one door down. That'd be even better, amen? We could buy all the houses that, 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 that could come up that you could afford in this world today, and it's still not going to be 100% yours, amen? It's going to be yours and the government's, because you're going to pay taxes on it some way or not, amen? That's what you're going to pay. But buddy, not in heaven, <clears throat> You see, not in heaven. In heaven, my friend, what you got is Jesus Christ says, I go to prepare a place for you. It's a personal residence that comes after the rescue. So my question to you today, tonight, if you want this assurance in your life that where you can walk through this world with complete assurance that you know what's on the other side, not only is there a rescue from your past, but there's a residence for the future. If, you, if today, if you want that assurance, I ask you, what are you trusting in to gain that assurance? What are you trusting for that residency? You trust in your talent? You trust in your treasure here? You trust in your time? No, you don't trust in your time. Jesus Christ said in Matthew 6, verse 20, But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven, whether neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break in, or break through, sorry, nor steal. Guys, we spend too much time on earth working for things which will simply just perish. I'm not saying you should not have um, uh, nice things. I'm not saying that you should not take care of what is in front of you. And I'm definitely not saying that you should not take care of that which is temporal. As a matter of fact, if you tune, tune in to part two of the uh, devotion tomorrow that'll be online, you'll find out exactly how I feel, what you should take care of, what God has given you right here, right now. Amen. Amen. We spend too much time, guys, too much time laboring and working on things that are going to go away. Hey, listen, when, when, when we should, we exert, we should uh, exert as much energy and as much effort into things in this world in the, that the elements cannot touch, meaning treasures in heaven. We should put as much energy in things in heaven as we would, as we do on things on this earth. So I ask you this, what makes you happy tonight? Where, where are you in your life? What, what, do you, what would you say tonight to making you content or happy or, 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 or even joyful for that matter? I mean, is your life at peace tonight? Is your life at peace right now? What do you have sat before you? What do you have coming up in the next couple of days that's on your, on your diary that's maybe giving you a little bit of a anxiety, giving you a little bit of anxiousness in your life? I mean, really and truly, what gives you joy? What gives you peace? What gives you excitement about the things that are around you? I mean, guys, I'm going to tell you, those things are going to go away. They're going to be gone. 
The older you get, you're going to look back at the amount of effort and energy that you placed in things that absolutely, positively serve zero purpose in your life in the long haul. And you can look back and you can say, you know what, I sure wish I'd have put some energy in the Lord Jesus Christ. I wish I'd have put some energy in the righteousness of God back then so I'd try to quit trying to make it up when you get older, amen. What are you going to do when those things are gone? I mean, what's make, these things that are making you happy in this world, what are you going to do when you lose them? Think about it for a second. Jesus Christ said this. Jesus Christ said, And I was standing in this rejoice, not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Do you know what should make us overjoyed tonight? Our names are written in heaven. Not because of what great feat we can do. Guys, you know, we're not going to cast devils out of anyone. That's not our job. That's not our duty as a, as a church. That's not our duty as a Christian. The Bible tells us, pray them out. All right? Those seven sons of Sceva made the mistake over there. Uh, laying them. They wanted to lay hands on someone like the Apostle Paul did, thinking they had the apostolic gifts, which died with John. That old devil looked at them and says, Paul, I know, Jesus, I know, but who are you? And they jumped on top of them, and they went out, ran out naked and wounded. Amen. They were exposed for the lies and the frauds they were. Amen. They wanted that ability. So my question to you is tonight, what talent, what treasure, what time, what ability do you have this evening that makes you happy in this world that you're putting your faith and your trust in? What on the immediacy of your life right now are you placing your trust in to make you happy? Because they will be soon, one day, gone. One of the things, uh, before Nisi and I married, we understood very quickly we had to really understand it quickly, seeing that nine months later, our first son came. But we'd already said in our heart before we were married that our first ministry was one another. My first ministry in this world is that woman sat right there. Her first ministry is me. That's a marriage. Amen? Our first ministry are those four children. It's not somebody else's job to raise our children. We didn't, live, we didn't believe in that. We didn't live like that. We raised our four children. But here, here's, the, here's the reality of it. One by one, as time moves on, those children are going to become parents. They're going to be married. They're going to be somewhere else. And so if our entire life revolved around raising our children, and that's all we had, guess what would happen when the, the empty nest kicks in? We'd have nothing with one another. We'd sit back and go, well, what do we have in common? Our central focus is those kids. It ain't no different than finding your identity and your occupation. Pastors are one of the worst that do this. Sports athletes are some, are, are some of the worst. They find their identity in the sport they play. They find their identity in the pulpit they, uh, they're, they're preaching from, men do. Our identity is in Christ. The assurance that we have in this world that it doesn't come from what I do or where I'm around or even who I'm with. My identity comes with what the Lord Jesus Christ has said and done for me, amen. And therefore, I'm going to do the job that he told me to do. And I'm going to go through this life with the assurance that God has commanded me to have. I married my best friend. I don't know what you did. I'm happy about it. Amen. We raised our four kids. We were with them. Good night. We were always together. We enjoyed that, amen. We always made sure that we had time for us. Because there'll come a day when, unfortunately, the kids won't be around. Guys, when you lay your head down at night, do you have an, ex you have an expectancy to see the Lord? Or is there a little bit of an emergency about his appearing? I mean, think about it, guys. What if the Lord Jesus Christ came back right now? Right this second. Well, that'd be nice if he did right there. That'd be nice. I, I couldn't time that any better. Wouldn't that be great? How does that make you feel? Are you expecting him? Are you looking for him? Are you excited about it? Or are you like, hmm, I don't know. I don't know if I'm ready. I'm going to go ahead and tell you this. There should not be one thing on this planet that should want to keep you from seeing Jesus Christ. Nothing. Amen. As much as I love my wife, love my children, love you guys, love this church, I'm ready to see, I'm ready to see my Savior, amen? I'm ready for him to come back. The truth of the matter is, guys, that not only is there a rescue, praise God for that, not only is there something to look forward to in our residence, but there is going to be a return. 
there is going to be a return. Look in verse 3 here and look at this promise we're given. The Bible says, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Beloved, one of the greatest promises ever given to the believer is, if I go, I'm coming back. I love one of, one of the, and I know, I try not to preach it every year, but during the Easter time, I love the story of the napkin. I'm not going to retell it now. I know I did it just a few weeks ago on Resurrection Sunday, but I'm, I'm, I love the story of that napkin that was folded up at the head of where Jesus Christ was laid. One of the greatest promises that Jesus ever gave us is that if I go, I'm coming back. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. You know why? You know why many people are not joyful tonight in their life? They have nothing to look forward to. They have nothing to look forward to. I mean, you know, nor do they have anything to see in themselves, no point, no rhyme, no reason other than work and play and sleep. That's it. Hamster wheel. Over and over and over and over and over. You know what, guys? I mean, we labor seven days a week, and we labor, and we work, and we do the things that we do in our life today. But we also know, as Christians, that we can walk through this life, we can work through this life, we can go through all the things that we do every single day in the midst of the labor, around the people, and all this stuff. And there's an assurance about us that we can carry in this world. that we got something to look forward to. This is not the greatest that it's going to be. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to what the Lord Jesus Christ has for us when he comes back and takes me out of here. I'm looking forward to that. Tonight, the question is, do you? When you get up from your pew tonight, after we finish our prayer here in just a little while, and you go home this evening, are you going to walk through that door with the assurance that if Jesus Christ comes back, he's coming back and taking you with him? The assurance, no doubts. The assurance from the, from, the, from the Word of God. Guys, I'm going to tell you, this world knows whether or not you know what you're talking about. This world knows whether or not you really believe what you say you believe. This world knows if you carry yourself with assurance or you're carrying yourself being timid of what's around the corner. I'm looking forward to the return of Jesus Christ. I'm excited about it. Do you know why I'm excited about it, Denise? I'm excited about it because I know for a fact that I've placed my unfeigned faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's the only thing that's getting me to heaven is what Jesus Christ did for me on the cross and that victory over the grave. Amen, Brother Preston? So tonight, guys, where's your assurance? Is your assurance in that rescue? I pray it is because that's the only thing that's going to save you. Is your assurance tonight knowing that you've got a residence up there with your name on it in heaven? Amen. Is your assurance tonight, are you walking through this world this evening with unfeigned faith, with assurance in his return in the air? That's the confidence that Jesus Christ has given us. And that's what he's told us in this Bible here tonight. And tonight the true test is this. Where is your assurance in this world? Is it in yourself? Or is it in Christ coming back with the residence he's built for us because of the rescue he gave to mankind? Will you bow your heads tonight? Thank you so much for joining us today. I do hope it